I have prepared some remarks so that I'm on time, and I'm uh, going to be uh, talking about some f uh, key aspects of uh, the Indian occupied Kashmir as well as um, some of the most important things. <laughs> it's kind of like taking my uh, attention away. And I'm ready to answer any questions that are any lingering concerns regarding Kashmir and some other details we can attend to in the Q&A. So thank you so much. <clears throat> I do want to start at the outset by saying that Genocide Watch has issued several alerts for Indian-occupied Kashmir, which is also called the world's largest open-air prison. These alerts remain very much active for a region where the 10 stages of genocidal process are already in an advanced stage. A major portion of India's defense budget is spent on Kashmir, which is occupied approximately by 700,000 Indian troops. The soldier to civilian ratio is roughly one soldier for eight Kashmiris, which is one of the highest in the world. Kashmiris exist in a state of siege, caught amidst a dense web of Indian soldiers, checkpoints, barbed wires, bunkers, military convoys, trucks, drones, armored vehicles, garrisons, secret prisons, jails, and military bases. Indian troops roughly occupy an area which is the size of Dallas, Texas, and it is growing. Since 1948, the issue of Kashmir, along with Palestine, has been on the agenda of, had been on the agenda of the newly formed United Nations. Yet, in the current neoliberal order, India easily gets away with downgrading Kashmir from an international dispute to categorizing it as a dom domestic or a bilateral issue or even a law and order problem. The dominant Indian nationalist ideologies project Kashmir as if it has no political history, no identity, no aspiration prior to 1947 when India itself became a country. <clears throat> the Kashmiri people's demand for the UN mandated right to self-determination is treated as a deviance. Their resistance is criminalized as rank terrorism. By 1989, the Indian occupied Kashmir was festering as a full-fledged terminal colonial situation. Then the popular armed insurrection also began in that year. India imposed the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, giving its military and paramilitary, including police, militia, and vigilante groups, the authority to act with impunity sans any accountability. The Indian forces have sweeping powers to make arbitrary arrests, and detentions carry out extrajudicial executions and shoot to kill on mere suspicion. The Indian government hails this Special Powers Act as key to their troops operating in Kashmir, thus admitting their inability to curb Kashmiri resistance without violating their human rights. Casting Kashmiri resistance unquestioningly in the erroneous stereotype of Islamic terrorism the government aligns its military action in Kashmir with global war on terrorism. This has enabled India to carry out gross, hum gross human rights violations in full glare of glo global community while propagating its settler colonial policies without criticism. Since 1989, over 100,000 Kashmiris, both combatants and non-combatants, have been killed by the Indian forces. There are 10,000 plus enforced disappearances Rape is deployed as a weapon of war, mass incarceration, and injuries like world's first mass blindings have been used to repress Kashmir res resistance. The Indian judicial structures do not consider the violations committed in Kashmir in light of relevant international human humanitarian law, that is the Geneva Conventions, the additional protocols, or the international criminal law. India has not legislated on crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. India's own domestic laws do not criminalize any type of human rights violations that they're committing in Kashmir, ranging from enforced disappearances, torture, rapes, to mass blindings. Even though militancy is at its lowest since it was in the 1990s, there is incredibly high number of casualties of these combatants. Their killing is a standard operating procedure. The law in Kashmir exists, but only as a tool of India's, Indian state's neo-colonial terrorism in Kashmir. In August 2019, the government of India's impunity in Kashmir became, became spectacular. Headed by the right-wing Hindu supremacist Bharatiya Janata Party, or the BJP for short, it illegally and militarily removed Kashmir's special quasi-autonomous status under Articles 30, 370 and 35A of the Indian Constitution. 
Kashmiris were kept under months-long curfew and communication lockdown, resulting in a humanitarian crisis. Executive orders which unilaterally removed Kashmir's territorial sovereignty and changed Kashmir's domicile laws have been passed to facilitate Indian settler colonialism through demographic shifts. The dispossession of indigenous Kashmiris with unemployment amongst them rising to a record above 48% and extractive exploitation of natural resources have become the hallmarks of neo-colonial de-development in Kashmir. The widespread xenophobia and Islamophobia fueled by Hindu supremacy and ethno-nationalism are also key to understanding the removal of Kashmir's autonomy. The re-annexation of Kashmir is claimed as triumph for the ide ideology of Hindu indigeneity in which India's own Muslim population is cast as invaders and foreigners, and Kashmiri Muslims are doubly marked as the other, first as Muslims and second as Kashmiris who are committed to an irrepressible struggle for the UN-mandated plebiscite and democratic sovereignty of their own. Hindu nationalists uh, openly celebrated the military action on Kashmir as a historic step towards establishing Hindu Rashtra or Hindu nation. An Indian actor and a prominent BJP supporter tweeted ominously, calling it, Kashmir's solution has begun. The similarity with the final solution was not lost on Muslim Kashmiris who were facing a brutal siege. This is when Genocide Watch issued one of its alerts in 2019. The fetishization of Kashmir, its land and its people, especially Kashmiri women, and perceiving them as spoils of war became a public sport in social media, the entertainment industry, and TV channels revealing India's colonial mentality. The growing atmosphere of communal hate and discriminatory policies at all political and economic and cultural levels, which are marginalizing Kashmiri Muslims, have created conditions for internecine rivalries. In the wake of discriminatory policies pushing demographic shifts that are fanning communal strife, the Kashmiri Pandits, the Mus Muslim collaborators of India, and Indian migrant workers who have long been in the region are becoming collateral damage in renewed militant attacks. The two pillars of any democratic society, namely the humorized defenders and the press, are both under crippling attack. Strict censorship has been a historical reality in Kashmir, but now the government of India has institutionalized and legalized it through a new media law that was passed in 2020. Any report that shows India in a negative light is essentially criminalized. Journalists are increasingly incarcerated, beaten, humiliated, and harassed for mere reporting. Just yesterday, as I was coming here on December 6th, one more senior journalist joined the growing list of incarcerated scribes. The criminalization of human rights activism is manifested in the incarceration of the internationally reputed and award-winning activist Kuram Parvez, who is also the president of Philippines-based Asian Federation Against Voluntary Disappearances. The number of Kashmiris as political prisoners, which was already high, is growing. The detentions are also marked by custodial death of key resistance leaders, including Sayyid Ali Gilani. There has been a pattern of selective and sh shallow solidarity where protecting human rights is limited to curbing in Indian military violence. This pattern must change. While it's crucial to stop human rights abuses in Kashmir, it is vital to recognize that India does not commit violations in a vacuum. These abuses are a singular result of India's disproportionate aggression against Kashmiris demanding their right to self-determination, which is a foremost human right. Despite India taking umbrage, international watchdogs, including United Nations, United Nations uh, Human Rights Commission, Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch, amongst others, have consistently reported on the urgency of resolving Kashmir uh, issue, which is also a nuclear, the region is also a nuclear flashpoint. The ultimate re resolution lies in the demilitarization and granting Kashmir the right to self-determination, fulfilling the 21st century goals of decolonization. The following recommendations are crucial for a path uh, to bring a just peace and a sustainable democracy uh, to the region, but are not just limited to this. India must scrap all illegal laws and executive orders that change Kashmir's domicile laws and territorial sovereignty with immediate effect, thus ensuring rights of indigenous peoples and minority, uh, and they are protected from settler colonialism and demographic change. India must remove the gag on media enacted in 2020 and allow free and fair reporting from the region. 
Kashmiri human rights organizations and civil society groups must be allowed to operate without duress. India must immediately and unconditionally release all political prisoners, including resistance leaders, journalists, and human rights defenders. India must allow humanitarian relief, international humanitarian relief, UN observers, media organizations, and researchers to freely enter Kashmir, which is banned as of now. The veil of obfuscation over Kashmir must be lifted. The global community must recognize that Kashmiri people, first and foremost, are the important, most important stakeholders in this uh, issue, and who are fighting a just fight, seeking their right to self-determination and an end to India's settler colonialism. Thank you so much.